When the first emperor of Rome, born Gaius Octavian, but known to the world as Augustus Caesar, died in Naples in 14 CE, his body was brought back to Rome, and after several days of funeral ceremonies, including gladiatorial contests, it was burned to top a massive pyre. After the many hours this would take to completely cremate the body, and the many days the pyre would take to cool, his bones were removed and placed in a golden urn, then interred in the massive mausoleum that Augustus himself had ordered built years earlier. Augustus certainly was not the first prominent Roman to receive the funerary rite of cremation. In fact, even his own adopted father, Julius Caesar, was cremated as well. Nor were his remains even the first to be laid to rest in this, his own mausoleum. But the fact that the very first emperor of Rome, who was, shortly after his death, proclaimed a god by the Roman Senate, received the public funerary rite of cremation, tells us quite a bit about the funerary customs of Rome at the time. Cremation was the way that Rome's most powerful citizens, and indeed even their semi-divine first citizen, or princeps, Augustus, secured proper passage to the afterlife. And yet, in one of those little quirks of history, it was during Augustus's reign as Caesar that a child was born, at the periphery of the empire in a town called Bethlehem, setting in motion events which would eventually come to utterly transform Augustus's empire. In fact, it was Augustus's empire-wide census, a tax collector's dream if there ever was one, that caused Joseph and Mary to leave Nazareth for Bethlehem, where the Christ child would be born. According to the Gospel of Luke, quote, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be taxed. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. End quote. So while Augustus's reign marks the beginning of imperial Rome and its imperial cult, and his death epitomizes the cultural power of cremation among the Roman elite, his reign also saw the birth of Jesus, an event which would forever change both of these foundational aspects of Roman culture. The fates of the Roman Empire and Christianity were intertwined from the very start. Like the Lands Between's own divine ruler, Merica, Jesus' arrival heralded, though no one knew it at the time of course, a profound change in the course of the empire's history, and one of the many ways that historical change manifested is in the changing of funerary customs. In the last episode, we analyzed the various death rituals of the Lands Between, many of which were inspired by the real world, specifically Roman, mortuary practices, and established that, surprising though it may seem, the catacombs were not built in the time of the earth tree, but instead were built much earlier, in a time when the crematory ghost flame, tended to by the death birds, was revered and wielded. In this episode, we will uncover more about this culture that worshipped the death birds, and introduce Merica's role into that story. As, just like Jesus in Rome, Merica's life and death will come to utterly transform the empire of the lands between. To begin with, let's follow up on our analysis of the death birds, and turn to the description of the twin bird kite shield, which reads, quote, The twin bird is said to be the envoy of an outer god, and mother of the death birds, end quote. This line of text has been picked over like a corpse in sky burial, and for good reason. It contains two quite interesting nuggets. The only mention of the twin bird and the outer god it serves in the whole game, 
and it tells us the relation between the twin bird and the death birds, those keepers of the cremation flame from the prior age, the age before the Erd tree. So we can pretty safely conclude that whatever outer god they serve, this outer god was key to the pre-Erd tree lands between, and was disempowered by the newly ascendant Erd tree and Golden Order. Unfortunately, that is the single item description referring to the twin bird. Luckily, as has been pointed out by others before, including by our Reddit muse Nameless Singer, there is another visual depiction of the twin bird, and it is highly informative. All throughout from Missoula, but most conspicuously on the lintel before entering Malaketh's arena, we can see a relief of what appears to be a twin bird. We can't glean the colors from a stone relief, of course, but otherwise the designs are nearly exact matches, right down to the position the wings are held in, and of course the midline axis of symmetry. At first glance, this isn't too surprising. After all, in this game, birds are just the descendants of dragons. That's why hawks are found in both Stormvale and Furumazula, and many of the non-ancient dragons actually have feathers, mirroring the real-world evolution of dinosaurs into birds. So seeing a relief of a bird in Furumazula, Land of Dragons, is easily rectified. But its implications are actually quite deep. For this would imply that, at least at some point in the timeless history of Furumazula, they worshipped the twin bird, and therefore they worshipped death, and they practiced cremation. If you've seen our analysis of Merica and the Glomai Queen, this should come as no surprise, that the Glomai Queen seems to have held her seat of power before the age of the Erd Tree in Furumazula. But there is one glaring counter-argument. If the inhabitants of Furumazula practiced cremation, then why are there beast graves clearly buried in the style of the Varna Necropolis? Well, as is so often the case, the answer is strata. There is simply no doubt that the beastmen buried their dead. In fact, they buried them to be close to their masters, the dragons. If you've played Bloodborne, then you will know this is pretty much precisely the civilizational arc of the Thumerians. First, they were mere attendants to the graves of their masters, the Great Ones, or in the case of Furumazula, the ancient dragons. Only later did they develop a society unto themselves. But dragons and beasts were not the only inhabitants of Furumazula. There was a third population, and it was this population that apparently burned their dead in ghost flame. When we made our first Furumazula video way back when, there were a few features we did not discuss. Chief among them were the reliefs of human royalty scattered throughout the area. These seem to suggest that there was a human population in Furumazula, indeed a population with its own political organization. But then where are their graves? The only graves we see contain beastmen, not human remains. The answer, of course, is that they weren't buried with the beastmen. They were cremated. Indeed, we can find cremation urns in a few places in Furumazula, like the Dragon Temple, the same place where we find lots of reliefs of the twin bird. It's hard to conclude any of this definitively, but it is quite suggestive at the very least that cremation is an ancient practice in the lands between. The distinctive funerary practices may even be a defining feature of the different cultures here, with the beastmen practicing ritual inhumation, in the style of the Varna Necropolis, and the humans practicing cremation, mirroring the real world where the earliest hominid burials, including Neanderthals, apparently buried their dead, whereas cremation appears to be a later innovation in prehistory. If indeed it was these humans, led by their queen, the queen of death before the age of the Erd Tree, the Glomide Queen, who practiced cremation, then not only would that explain the lack of human remains or graves despite these human reliefs, but it ties quite nicely with the lintel of the twin bird. This lintel is found in the dragon temple where the crematory urns are also found, and it is seen above the temple which contains the old Elden Ring. The Elden Ring before the Rune of Death was removed, sitting above a statue that may in fact be the Glomai Queen herself. 
One possibility is that both humans and beasts were cremated after the arrival of the Glomide Queen and the Twin Bird. But we favor the alternative interpretation, that of a socially stratified society where only humans were allowed to be cremated, while the beasts were deliberately buried adjacent to their idols, the dragons. Since the human reliefs certainly suggest that the humans were the rulers, and there is indeed some historical precedent for such a stratified burial practice, perhaps most strikingly in Mughal, India. Ruling class Muslims practiced burial and considered cremation blasphemous, while subject Hindus continued to practice their traditional cremation. This stratification continued up until the 20th century at least, under British colonial rule. Point is, there is clear historical precedent for socially stratified burial practices, and this may be precisely what is conveyed in Burumazula. So now let's return to the terrestrial lands between and the catacombs. As we introduced back in our America in the Earth Tree episode, the late St. Entry Empire, that is to say the High Roman period defined by the divine bridges, the saint statues, great tree worship, and of course Colosseums, can't be Roman without grand Colosseums, was a period during which there was an influential practice of libation ritual borne out iconographically in the libation statues seen in the chapels and structures dating to this period. But what we didn't talk about at the time was, well, what kind of libations were they? And that is where we pick up today's story. The various libation poses and rituals are quite clearly funerary libations dating to the Saint and Great Tree era. We can deduce this from a few pieces of evidence. For one, the priestesses shown pouring the libations are also shown in other poses, most commonly in the catacombs and in the churches, each from the Saint and Great Tree era. They are unambiguously the same character, or at least member of an order of priestesses, as they have the same dimensions, the same style cloak, and are often made of the same bronze material. Stylistically, they are quite clearly modeled off of the Vestal Virgins, Rome's order of famously chaste priestesses, who performed many of the critical sacred duties of the city, and tended to their sacred flame. As we reviewed before, this same character is shown in three different poses. One is the libation pose, seen most commonly in the churches. Then there is the unique pose, seen only in the Chapel of Anticipation. We'll come back to that one in a minute. And finally, there are the chthonic mudra poses seen exclusively in the catacombs. Always this character is cloaked and hooded, but her pose varies by the context. And we can be sure that this order of priestesses is critical to the funerary rites of the lands between because of how prominent her statues are in the catacombs. Heroes' graves and even the sewers of Landell. So that's the first key point. These are an order of priestesses with critical roles in death rituals. And we can tell a bit more about the nature of this libation ritual by studying the long forgotten areas of the game where this ritual iconography still perdures. In the deepest, darkest parts of Stormvale Castle, in a long abandoned area infested with rats and, well, something far worse, lie the remains of an ancient processional way. Though there are scattered saint statues and libation statues here, seemingly discarded from the upper ramparts, at least two of the statues appear to be in their original place, as they flank the sides of the corridor and have been left undisturbed. Not to mention the concept art of this area, which, though clearly some things have changed, does show libation statues as a critical and original part of the scene. So the question is, why are there libation statues here, of all places, and what was their original use? Well, if we follow this path further, we can see this is a burial ground, specifically of boat burial tradition. This is also where you get the Rancor Call spell, which draws upon the crematory ghost flame we described in detail last episode. 
and the torches here are ghost flame, just like in the catacombs, further confirming that this site is a burial site. So what this seems to imply is that the libations we've seen are actually funerary libations, something that of course was quite common in the ancient Greek and Roman world. These libations, simply put, were offerings, usually of wine, for the soul of the recently deceased, a practice which predates Greece and Rome but saw its most pervasive cultural implementation with those shared cultures. Often libations were used to mask the smell of burnt flesh during the cremation itself. In other words, let's all pour one out for those lost in the ancient wars of the lands between. That we see the libation statues here, in the old burial ground beneath Stormvale, and in the old churches of the Empire, like the Church of the Eclipse, Stormvale Chapel, and Redmain Chapel, makes perfect sense. Hopefully you haven't been to too many funerals yourselves, but probably you know that it typically begins in the church and ends in the burial ground. And finally, the libations, of course, of this era would have been sap of the great tree. As a fun aside, there is some historical precedent for this seemingly odd relationship between libations and tree sap. Of course, more common ingredients for libations would be water, wine, sometimes milk or honey. But in Greek and Roman times, it was common to store wine in amphorae sealed with tree resin, specifically pine resin, the purpose of which was to keep the air out and prevent unwanted aerobic fermentation contaminants but which ultimately gave the wine a distinctive flavor. This flavor is still common today in wines like Retzina, but now, of course, it is far more common to use barrels for storing an aging wine. So it is likely that many a Roman libation made with tree sap have been poured, as they would have used resonated wine as the libation. And incidentally, the widespread use of resonated wine stopped with the advent of barrels in the 3rd century CE, right around the time of the switch from cremation to inhumation in the empire. In the real world, of course, this relationship between shifting winemaking and funerary practices is undoubtedly coincidental, but for Elden Ring, the stylistic inspirations match perfectly. So the libations of the saint and tree era were predominantly funerary libations made from the sap of the great tree and bestowed by the Vestal Priestesses. But that is not how they remained, for within the order of the Vestals there arose a reformer who would utterly transform, among other things, the funerary customs of the lands between. And that reformer, of course, was Merica. The Erdtree's favorite talisman reads, quote, It is said that when the age of the Erdtree began, such blessings were personally bestowed upon their recipients by Queen Merica herself. End quote. This tells us a few important things, not least of which is that at the onset of the age of the Erdtree, Merica was a bestower of sap blessings, a description that certainly jives with the depiction on the talisman itself, showing Merica pouring out a libation. But more importantly is how this image deviates from the conspicuously modest Vestals of the prior era. Not only is Merica's hood removed, flaunting her golden locks, but her life-giving bosom is shown just as prominently. The message couldn't be clearer. This is not your grandmother's libation ritual. This is libation for a new era. This libation is diametric to the death rite libations, for it is now part of a birthright, the literal blessings of the Erd Tree. We might say that the Great Tree Funerary Libation became the Erd Tree Rebirth Libation, and Merica's visual contrast to the conspicuously chaste Vestals of the prior era is no coincidence. So then what became of the former Vestals? Well, in the real world, the fate of the Vestals is quite tragic and informative. As Christianity rose from within the Roman Empire, the old pagan rituals became less prominent, though the Vestals themselves survived long after many other pagan cults, a testament to their vital importance to the old Roman way. 
In the end, it was the Emperor Theodosius I. As you can tell from his name, he was a Christian emperor, indeed a prolific persecutor of pagans, who disbanded the Vestals and finally, definitively, extinguished their sacred flame. The parallels to the fate of the sacred ghost flame in America's reign are clear enough. And with a bit of artistic liberty, we can deduce the fate of the old libation priestesses in the lands between. Though it took many centuries, many of the practices and traditions of the Roman Vestals would re-emerge in the Western Empire in the form of Catholic nuns. Though by then their clothing was different, it's hard not to see the similarity between these two exclusively female religious orders who vowed celibacy. And wouldn't you know it, in the Chapel of Anticipation where we start the game, and where our maiden is found slain, we can see the old libation lintel. If you look carefully at this lintel, it appears to display a sort of initiation ceremony with cloaked vestals bestowing a blessing upon another new initiate of their order. And this pose, the pose of the character to the left, is precisely the pose we see in the unique bronze statue in the chapel. This is the pose of initiation into the order. No coincidence then that we find a finger maiden here. Finger maidens are the remaining cultural legacy of those old libation priestesses. They would apparently be initiated here in this chapel to wait, in anticipation, the arrival of their tarnished. Of course, this was not America's only reform. As we alluded to in part one of this analysis, the Erd Tree cycle of life seems to be predominantly America's innovation. And if the formerly funerary libation ritual has been turned into a life-giving blessing of rebirth, then it makes perfect sense that America reformed the burial process as well. So now finally, we come to the discrepancy we highlighted at great lengths in part one of this analysis. The fact that the catacombs, which are said to be the site of Erd Tree burial, were clearly built before the era of the Erd Tree, in a time of cremation in Ghost Flame. So just as America reformed the libation ritual, so she reformed the burial rites in the catacombs. It was, of course, during America's reign that the catacombs were turned into essentially industrial processing plants for the rite of Erd Tree burial. The dead, whose remains were once sitting in cremation urns or stone sarcophagi, were added to the Erd Tree roots. And, as is so often the case in the real world, with these reforms and this new age came the deliberate diminishment and desecration of the old. So it is that these statues atop the hero's graves, showing a dying person being carried, had their heads removed. We don't know who these characters are, but we may point out that it is not a specific person or named hero, since it's the same identical statue atop each of the five heroes' graves. But what we can say, based on the visual design, specifically the fact that the cloak ends unnaturally, is that for sure this is a statue that has been beheaded, not a statue of a headless man. One can only presume that this scene depicts a man in his death throes being carried to cremation. And inside each and every one of the hero's graves, but not found nearly anywhere else in game, there is a statue of an unidentified woman, again stylistically modeled off of the Vestals, whose hands appear to have been cut off. In the real world, handless statues are pretty much never the result of deliberate vandalism. It's simply a result of the fact that limbs are the most fragile part of the statue, so they tend to fracture over the centuries. But here, in the hero's graves, every single one of them has had their hands cut off in exactly the same way. We say cut off because it's simply implausible that each and every one of the dozens and dozens of statues would crumble in precisely the same way. No, indeed, the consistency of their broken features indicates a deliberate act. Either that, or they're just reused assets, but where's the fun in that? The statues, like the headless ones up above, seem to have been intentionally and systematically vandalized. 
In the real world, this type of iconographic vandalism targeting a specific image is called iconoclasm and is a quite well documented and important historical phenomenon. It took perhaps its most famous form with Byzantine iconoclasm, but iconoclasm as a general phenomenon existed long before Christianity, extending at least as far back as the Middle Egyptian Kingdom, during which the symbols of the so-called first monotheism, the pharaoh Akhenaten's sun disk cult, were systematically destroyed after his death. A related phenomenon is the destruction of the symbols of the prior rulers themselves, called damnatio memore. Think of the famous images of Saddam Hussein's statue being toppled after the American invasion of Iraq, or indeed the conspicuously missing statue in an Orlando of Lord Gwynne's firstborn child. Point being, both in the real world, and in Miyazaki's fictional ones, the destruction of icons is nothing new. And even more specifically than that, early Christian iconoclasm, before the Byzantines, when the focus of iconoclastic ire were the pagan idols of old, would quite commonly manifest as the literal dismemberment, that is to say the removal of a specific body part, of the old Greek and Roman pagan statues. In reality, often these pagan symbols lived on and were recontextualized or assimilated by the Christians, instead of simply being destroyed by them. But the practice of icon destruction does have clear historical precedent, and often this would mean removing the genitalia from the classical statues, because of course those early Christians would not tolerate seeing marble schwanzes in their faces all day. So not only is iconoclasm in general an informative historical parallel, but so specifically is the removal of the parts of the statue deemed offensive, in one case the genitals, in other case the hands. To return to the lands between, the question is, why are these statues specifically vandalized when the other priestess statues, including the libation statues above ground in the chapels, are left untouched? And why specifically are the hands cut off? Well, if America's innovation was turning the funerary libation into a life-giving one, then perhaps nothing would be more intolerable to this new order than the connection between libations and death. So while we can never be sure exactly what these handless statues were holding, the simplest explanation is that they too were holding libations. But they were libations of death. And in America's new age of life-giving libation, such a reminder of the old connection between libation and death could not stand. In the end, it all comes back to America's primary transgression. Like Gwyn before her, America's betrayal of a fundamental duality of the world allowed her to take power and enjoy a brief golden age, but set in motion events that would ultimately bring about the endless pain and suffering of her reign. America removed the rune of death and tried in vain to create a world of perpetual life without death. In turn, she took the funerary libation and turned it into a libation of rebirth, removing all evidence of the previous association of libations with death. And of course, she turned the catacombs from a place where death was burned in ghost flame into a place where bodies were recycled at the roots of the earth tree, fully closing her new arboreal cycle of life and preventing anyone from achieving true death. Like the early Christians that transformed the old funerary practices of the Romans and destroyed the symbols of the old pagan cults, so too did America's rise utterly transform these foundational aspects of the culture of the lands between. In the end though, this hubristic transgression against the fundamental balance of the world was destined to fail, and it was only a matter of time before a rebalancing would occur for death to once again spread throughout the land.